uh, certainly a pleasure to be with you this afternoon to talk about some of the work that's ongoing in our uh, uh, research group. Uh, my name is Babak Parviz. I'm with uh, multiple centers actually on our campus. Uh, most prominent among them is the Microscale Life Sciences Center. That's, uh, that's an NIH-funded uh, research group that is focused on developing tools for uh, uh, conducting studies in biology at the single cell level. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. and. Um, this presentation does involve some technology that's used to detect molecules, but at the beginning of the presentation, I wanted to give you just a very short overview of uh, what has been happening in the past few years in the nano and microelectronics industry, what capabilities are available, and then tell you uh, how we've uh, attempted to take advantage of these capabilities in uh, detecting molecules. We have uh, developed a, a number of uh, different ways to electronically and directly in a label-free fashion detect uh, biomolecules of interest. So I'll go through three of them. And we've also worked on uh, uh, developing very cheap methods to make biosensors that you can deploy uh, perhaps in a field. So these are uh, plastic disposable uh, detection systems that you may be able to use in, de in the developing world. Now on to the under the current trends. Uh, I would like to show you a few graphs, and those of you uh, who are familiar with the electronics, you might have seen these, uh, these curves before, but they show you the progress of the microelectronics industry roughly in the past 40 years or so. This is an extremely aggressive industry. It has a, uh, had a phenomenal, actually, success in the past uh, few years, and uh, most of you are, uh, use uh, the products that have come out of the semiconductor industry. Uh, the curves that you will see in the next uh, few slides have all uh, the, the years um, as the, the x-axis. So this uh, business started in the late 60s, early 70s. On the y-axis, you see the progress. And what you notice is that these, this progress is pr uh, primarily exponential. When the semiconductor uh, industry started to take off in the late 60s, early 70s, you would be able to make uh, microprocessors, that what, that's what goes into your computer, that had a few thousand transistors at the two, three, four thousand level. And this number has gone up exponentially throughout the years. And now we're reaching one billion transistors per microprocessor. So what does it mean in terms of new capabilities? That means that you can now construct a an object, an engineered object, that has one billion parts. All of them are there by design, not by coincidence, and not by simple repetition. They're all there by design, one billion of them. All of them work together, and uh, they do something useful. They make a microprocessor that goes to your laptop. What's really also interesting about this capability is not just the complexity of these uh, structures and systems, is the fact that you can go to Best Buy and buy them for a few hundred dollars. So they're affordable. <laughs> so this level of complexity it's, uh, is not exotic in just uh, some lab somewhere that's not accessible to the public. You can go and buy these things. The second interesting thing is um, the size scale of these engineered uh, systems. These uh, chips are made of primarily transistors. The transistors are the basic components that go into the overall system. And if you look at the critical dimension of these transistors over the years, we've been able to make them smaller and sp uh, smaller, and the trend also is exponential. So if you go back to the beginning of this semiconductor revolution, you could make transistors functional devices that were uh, as small, roughly, as the diameter of the human hair. And this uh, size has dropped over the years. And uh, some time ago, actually many years ago, uh, almost uh, 20 years ago or so, uh, we were able to uh, create them as small as a bacteria. And this trend has continued. So right now, what we can make regularly in the semiconductor industry is devices that are com comparable in size with the virus. So in the 100 nanometer size scale or smaller. So not only we can make a lot of things and interconnect them to make something complex, we can make, him, uh, make the components to be extremely tiny. This is all artificially manufactured, but we can uh, make 50 nanometer structures, 100 nanometer structures on a regular basis in an affordable way. Uh, I wanted to show you a picture. This is uh, um, a comparison between how a chip would look like. It's a photograph of a portion of a chip and a, s uh, a satellite image of Buenos Aires. This is an older microprocessor. I don't know if any of you in the audience may even remember this microprocessor. But again, it, just to show you the complexity of these things that we're building right now on, uh, on, on a chip. 
These are very complex. So you're literally dealing with uh, a city design, but the area of your city is this large. Lots of parts, all by design, in the right location. They work in harmony to do something useful. Uh, if you look at the state of the art uh, microprocessor, this is Penryn. This is, was, this is something that Intel introduced a few months ago in 2007. This is a device, this is just a few inches across, has 820 million transistors, which is larger than the population of the uh, Western Hemisphere, roughly. It's made in the 40 na uh, 5 nanometer technology. That means that a typical transistor that you find in this uh, device is a few hundred times smaller than a typical white blood cell. So artificially, we can make these structures. And this clocks at uh, about 3 gigahertz. That means there are voltage levels that you can control uh, here with sub-nanosecond time precision. So not only this has a lot of parts, not only this has a lot of tiny parts, but it can work extremely fast. So now these, these are time scales that are accessible to us as electrical engineers. Uh, which were absolutely not accessible a few decades ago. So this is a fundamentally new capability to, uh, to be able to operate in a time domain with very, uh, very short uh, time spans. Uh, if you look at the number of transistors that are shipped per day, again, it's an exponential term. So it, back in 2004, uh, the number was close to uh, 10 to the 18 transistors per year. So we're talking about astronomical number of uh, components that this industry produces. And more importantly, and we uh, mentioned this briefly, the cost per transistor also has dropped from a dollar back in the 70s, early 70s, late 60s, to something that's essentially negligible. The drop in cost is also exponential. So these are very aggressive technology development curves. And um, our hope is actually to take advantage of all these new found uh, capabilities to do something interesting in medicine and biology. So just to recap what, what has happened in the past uh, few decades, we have fundamentally new capabilities to make small devices, smaller meaning definitely submicron, maybe to uh, down to 100 uh, nanometer le levels and below. These devices can work very fast, so we have access to, uh, to time domains that are ex very short. These devices could be made of very tiny com uh, components and a lot of them, and very importantly, they're cost effective. So all these very sophisticated technologies are accessible, sometimes at the few, just a few dollar level. So this is pretty, this is pretty important. So how do we take advantage of these uh, in biology and medicine? Uh, I'd like to show you a few examples in the next few minutes of how we've tried to take advantage of these small devices to directly detect molecules that are of interest in perhaps laboratory medicine uh, in medicine in general and definitely in, in biology. So the first thing I wanted to uh, t talk to you about is uh, using silicon nanowires in detecting biomolecules. So imagine now a circuit. This is a very simple circuit that's made of a battery, a loop, and something that can measure current. You can, uh, you can turn on the circuit and the current will flow and you can measure the current flowing through this. Now let's look at this loop for a second. Assume that this loop is made of a semiconductor, and this is the cross-section of the loop. If I manage to somehow place the receptor molecules on the surface of the loop, you may get a structure that resembles this. Now, if I expose this whole structure to something that involves the target molecules, it's uh, perceivable that the target molecules would uh, would bind to the receptors and you get this uh, molecular binding event. So, so far, so good. Now, when these attachments happen, when these bindings happen, it's, Im uh, it's important to see what happens in the structure of this wire. If your wire is made of a semiconductor, and we typically use a silicon uh, as, a, as a good semiconductor, the effect of binding of these uh, targets to the surface uh, is to change the semiconductor band diagrams right under the surface and, in effect, change the conductivity of the structure. This could be because of the net charge of these molecules or their net dipole moment. This is a very surface-confined effect. What happens here just happens in the first few nanometers under the surface. So if you have a large wire, you will never be able to, change, uh, to detect this change. But if you scale down this wire to be only 
maybe 50 nanometers wide, extremely tiny, then because the conduction is primarily a surface effect, you'll be able to detect these, uh, these binding events. So this is one mechanism that uh, we're looking at to detect molecular recognition and binding events directly without any label. And we get an electronic signal out of our device. How do we make these wires? These are all the built on the University of Washington campus. We have all the tools necessary to build these very tiny structures. This is the process, uh, essentially, the object is made typically on a, on a silicon and insulator wafer with electron beam lithography. So without going through the details of how the structure is made, I'll show you the final, final product. This is typically how these uh, uh, sensors look like. This is an actual uh, scanning electron microscope image of one of these sensors that we build on campus. This is your conducting, uh, semiconducting loop. Typic uh, typically, the width is about 50 nanometers. We can regularly construct these types of devices. And obviously, there are some other interconnects that, uh, that go into this. Now you can, you can take this, put your receptor of choice on the surface, and do measurements with it. The simplest uh, possible measurement that you could do is uh, to put a molecule on the surface that can protonate or deprotonate and measure pH with it. And we've done that. Um, and this is the type of readout that you get out of these devices. Obviously, you're dealing with very tiny currents. So this is the current here is as picoamp level. But you can readily have something that measures pH, which is good, but probably not the most exciting one for, uh, for a biological application. Something that's a lot more, uh, more interesting is detecting short strands of DNA. So this is an example of uh, experiments that we've, uh, we've done and published of how you can directly, in a label-free fashion, detect a particular DNA strand of interest. Um, in this case, we had uh, a, a sequence that we typically work with uh, 12 or 14 base long uh, uh, oligonucleotides. We have the complementary str uh, strand immobilized on the surface of this wire, and then we expose it to a solution that you'd like to study. And what we've been able to show is that even if there is uh, one base uh, pair mismatch between your receptor and the molecule that you would like to detect, you'd be able to call that uh, one base pair mismatch. So it's a very nice way to directly electronically detect uh, a particular strand of DNA. We've also uh, experimented with uh, proteins. This is a very simple, uh, simple experiment. Uh, the expert is actually already in the audience, so as she can tell you. Uh, an extra member of my group, she can tell you how to do these experiments uh, readily. Uh, in this case, we had a very simple experiment with the biotin Im immobilized on the surface of these wires, and we were trying to detect uh, streptavidin. And the reason I have this curve here is to show you that uh, you can also get a time response. So you don't, uh, you don't have to wait for a long time to get your response out. As soon as the, the target is present, you can detect this electronically and directly. So we've made uh, quite a few of these uh, sensors. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, a center on campus that's charted with uh, developing tools to do uh, uh, biology at the single cell level. So the, the final um, location of these sensors will be around uh, single cells to look at molecular traffic uh, in and out of a live cell. What we would like to do also to be able to uh, multiplex these sensors. So the question is, can I make different sensors, very tiny different sensors, and detect multiple different targets at the same time. So that would be a, a very useful thing. We have looked at a different uh, transconduction mechanism for this type of detection. Uh, that relies on nanoelectrodes and functionalizing these nanoelectrodes with different types of uh, receptor molecules. So one example that we looked at was detecting uh, microRNA. This audience is quite familiar with microRNA, so probably there's no need to go through why you'd like to detect microRNAs. Um, and there are already very good methods, actually, to detect microRNA. So we can certainly go to a laboratory and detect it. They appear to be somewhat time consuming, though. So it would be nice to have a way for detecting microRNA that's very quick. And um, it can operate with live cells. So we can position it next to live cells and see if we can detect a, a particular uh, molecule near a live cell. So instead of lysing and then running a gel and then radioactive labeling, uh, perhaps we could uh, develop a method that's uh, more or less real time. Uh, and hopefully this method would, be, uh, would allow us to multiplex our detection scheme. 
So our detection scheme is very straightforward. It's uh, not complicated at all. This is how it works. You have three electrodes. There is a counter electrode, a working electrode, and a control electrode. The difference between the control electrode and the working electrode is that you have immobilized a monolayer of receptor molecules on the surface. And then you can apply a voltage between th these two electrodes, and you can apply a similar voltage between these two electrodes. Everything is in a solution, and get a current flowing between these two electrodes and these two electrodes. Now, if you have your target molecule present, this target molecule will bind to the surface of the electrode that has the receptors, and it will change uh, the effective conductance between these two electrodes. And if you compare the two, you can tell whether the target is present or not. When the target molecules actually bind to the surface of these electrodes, multiple things can happen. If you have a very insulating uh, layer, uh, you'll get electron tunneling. If these molecules are very long, obviously you're not going to get too much electron tunneling, so the currents will be extremely small. If you have redox active uh, species in the, in the solution, you can also have uh, redox uh, reaction happening right on the surface of the electrodes. But very simply, if, uh, if I think of this as a collection of insulators and small channels that can get blocked or unblocked by the target molecule, you can change the effective conductivity of these devices. The specific molecule that we worked with uh, was uh, this one. Uh, this is a sequence. This is a, a muscle tissue specific microRNA. Uh, so all you need to do is to design a receptor for this, which was the complementary strand, and show that you can immobilize the, uh, the complementary strand onto your nano electrode and do measurements with it. Uh, this is very quick how we make the nano electrodes. These are standard uh, semiconductor microfabrication processes, again, all done at the uh, university laboratories here. We have very good uh, clean rooms. What you get uh, is an effective electrode area, typically that's about 70 nanometers tall and 100, uh, I'm sorry, 10 microns wide. So this is typically the size of the, size of the electrodes. And this is where you would immobilize the receptors. This is how they look like. This is a scanning electron microscope Im image of one of these openings for the uh, electrodes. The scale bar is about uh, 200 nanometers. And what's nice about these techniques is that uh, these are parallel production methods. So once you make one of them, you can make thousands or hundreds of thousands of these devices. So we don't have to make one. Uh, that's a nice thing about the semiconductor microfabrication processes. Important thing is how you put the receptors on these uh, uh, nanoscale electrodes. In, in this particular case, we wanted to immobilize DNA. So uh, you can get thiolated DNA and immobilize it on gold electrodes. This is what we do. So if you look at, for example, what happens to the control electrode and what happens to the working electrode, they go through these uh, series of uh, reactions until we have the right uh, molecule immobilized on the surface. So in this case, first we form the DNA uh, self-assembly molecule on both electrodes. And what happens is that you can now uh, electronically send the command and release the molecules from the surface. So that's the nice thing about ha having access to electronics. So we electrochemically desorb the molecules from the surface of the control electrodes and uh, self-assemble again on the available surface a peg, uh, peg thiol, basically, to prevent further binding of any molecule to the control electrodes. So the whole uh, uh, process here gives you the ability to have nanoscale electrodes and program these nanoscale electrodes with different molecules, with different receptors. So you can have multiplexed uh, detection. So you can have a very tiny sensor that doesn't uh, uh, occupy a large area and also has the ability to detect multiple molecules at the same time. So far, we have just uh, used them for detecting one molecule, but in principle, this can be applied to uh, multiplex detection. You can uh, do the desorption experiments on the flat surface and show that uh, the molecules go where they're, they're, they're supposed to go. This is an FDIR of these experiments on a flat substrate. Uh, and uh, you can show that the, uh, these electrodes, nanoscale electrodes, are useful for detecting uh, microRNA. Uh, in this case, the concentration is not very high, is, uh, uh, but is also not very low. It's 10 uh, micromolar concentration. And our hope is to scale that this down further, make it a lot more sensitive, and, uh, and use them uh, in more, more realistic scenarios. Uh, 
so, so far the techniques that I showed you uh, work with collections of molecules. These are not single molecule methods. They can detect concentrations definitely in micromolar down to maybe a few nanomolar and we're def hoping to uh, reduce that uh, sensitivity further. But the question is, can you detect molecules at one molecule level electronically or maybe a few molecule level? There is a technique uh, known right now for almost 40 years that is quite helpful in doing that, in detecting molecules at the, at the nanoscale level. So the basic principle of the technique is, uh, is shown here. It's, uh, it was first discovered at the Ford Motor Company um, laboratories in, in Michigan. And it works this way, that if you have two metal electrodes, and these metal electrodes are close enough to each other, take, take out this molecule for a second, if you apply a voltage between the two, the electrons can tunnel through and make it to the second electron, and you'll get a current flowing through the structure. So this is called electron tunneling. It's a quantum mechanical event. It's not a classical event. If you just have classical physics, this will never happen because the electrons see a large barrier to overcome for going from one electrode to another one. So this effect was known, actually, before uh, this, uh, this paper came out in 1966. Now the question is, what happens if you put a molecule between these two electrodes? What happens to the, to the electron going through the junction, tunneling through the junction? So what uh, was noticed was that as the electron goes through the molecule, it can couple to the vibronic modes of this molecule and excite them. So if you have the right energy of the electron, you can excite a vibronic mode in the molecule and uh, your effective conductivity will change. This is very similar to uh, doing FDIR, uh, Fourier transform infrared uh, spe spectroscopy experiments. What you do there is instead of using electrons, you use a photon. You have a molecule, you excite that molecule with a photon, excite vibronic modes of the molecule with a photon, and from there you, uh, you determine what the internal molecular structure uh, was here we're doing this with electrons. We shoot electrons through this molecule. These uh, molecules that begin to vibrate, we look at those vibranic modes, and from that you can infer what the internal structure was. Uh, so the, ex the experiments have been done on large collections of molecules now for uh, a long period of time. Uh, this is, for example, a signature for uracil, meaning that uh, you can take a fingerprint, an electronic fingerprint of a molecule. These experiments primarily have been done, though, to this date, on large collections of molecules. The question is how far you can scale this down, and can you do this just on a few molecules? If you want to have the ability to do this experiment with just a few molecules, you have to have electrodes that are comparable in size with the molecule itself. So the question is how do you make electrodes that are that small? So this is a technique that we've developed, again, at the university here uh, to make very small electrodes. What we do is that uh, we take a membrane, suspended membrane, usually made of silicon nitride. We uh, make very narrow conductive lines on this membrane, typically made of uh, gold or chromium gold. This is how they look like uh, under a scanning electron microscope. So they're typically about 90 nanometers wide. And then we uh, just pass current through these wires. And I think a lot of you might have uh, done this experiment already. If you take a piece of wire and start passing current through it, the wire is happy. Increase the current. Increase the current further and further. And after, uh, after a while, the a wire would spark and break. So that's what we're doing at nanoscale. We're controllably actually breaking these wires to, take a, to make a small gap between the two pieces of the wire. If you do that, you can also look at this process under, under transmission electron microscope and see how this wire is breaking. This is exactly how the wire is breaking. So initially, you have a complete wire, and then the grains begin to move around. Uh, it thins. You form this very narrow neck, and eventually it breaks. So this is right before breaking. This is the gold wire. This is the two pieces of the gold wire. And this is right when it breaks. And we can stop the process right there. Uh, the scale bar here is about 10 nanometers. And this is where we put our molecules. So you can make a gap between two metal electrodes that uh, fits probably four or five gold atoms or a molecule of your, of your choice. Uh, 
Uh, we can definitely make this gap larger if you like, but the challenge is how you make it this small, and we've been able to do that. So now, next thing you do is uh, you take a molecule that would self-assemble on gold, and you put it in this gap. So this is an experiment with the mercapto undecanoic acid, fairly simple molecule, put in these gaps, and uh, after we did this, we, uh, we collected the uh, electronic fingerprint of the molecule. So you can actually see the vibronic mode of the molecule showing up in the uh, electron tunneling uh, spectra. So you can do these types of experiments and detect molecules at the one molecule level, if you would like, directly electronically without any label. Uh, so these, uh, these techniques that we've discussed so far are quite uh, useful for making uh, sophisticated electronic detection systems. And one thing that all of, uh, all of us know is that the gold standard for detection still is, is optical and primarily for fluorescence. So a lot of experiments in biology and medicine are done with the fluorescent microscope. There are two things that we're looking at right now in fluorescent microscopy. One is that how do you do fluorescent microscopy, fluorescent detection, if you're in the middle of nowhere? If you're somewhere in the developing world, you'd like to do fluorescent detection, you don't have access to a sophisticated fluorescent microscope, how would you conduct this experiment? That's number one. Number two, as I mentioned, we have a center that is focused on developing biology at the single cell level. You can use a microscope and run a single cell experiment. But how do you replicate that, uh, that experimental setup and do uh, experiment on 1,000 cells? Are you going to buy 1,000 fluorescent microscopes? Uh, actually, med school here is quite uh, wealthy. Maybe you can afford it. But in engineering, unfortunately, we uh, may not be able to afford 1,000 fluorescent microscopes. So we have to come up with different methods, actually, of doing this experiment. So we've looked at how we can uh, strip down a fluorescent detection scheme to the bare minimum and uh, construct fluorescent detection uh, systems that can do very basic measurements and make them very parallel. In, in principle, and very cheap. So if you like to do fluorescent detection, you have to have some basic components. What you like to have, obviously, is an ex excitation source, similar to uh, a laser, perhaps, uh, diode that you have uh, in a laser pointer. You would need uh, detectors for detecting light, and you need some filters, actually, to do fluorescent microscopy. Unfortunately, that's also pretty important and necessary. So if you could uh, microfabricate all of them and then put them on a, on a substrate, maybe we can make a, a fairly elementary fluorescent detection system. This is how we do it. Uh, we take a substrate. Uh, this is a template for a system, uh, a microsystem. And we make all the components of the microsystem independently. These are micron scale components. Uh, the template has binding sites that have complementary uh, shapes with uh, what the components look like. And then we flow these microcomponents over the binding sites. They, the shapes match. They fall into the right location. And they self-assemble, quote unquote, self-assemble to complete a system on plastic, glass, whatever disposable substrate that you're, you're interested in. And this is how we can get components that come from very incompatible processes, integrate them to get uh, a fully functional uh, device. So making these templates is usually quite uh, straightforward. We process on glass or flexible plastic substrates. So these are things that are similar to um, transparency sheets that you'd use uh, for uh, overhead, overhead projectors, for example. You can print them even. So these are very low cost uh, templates for making uh, sensors. As for the components, I'll show you some of the processes that we use to make uh, sensors. This is a process on um, uh, a silicon and insulator wafer to make photo detectors. The design principle for all of our components are the same. We take a semiconductor wafer. Uh, the, there's a top layer that sits on a sacrificial layer that we can eventually remove and uh, create uh, freestanding free devices. Again, all these processes are done uh, in uh, uh, clean room facilities that we have at the University of uh, Washington uh, on campus here. So. The, the, the cartoons here basically t tell you what steps that we have to go through to make uh, photo sensors. The important thing is that these processes are very parallel. And at the end of the day, you can release these detectors from the substrate that carries them and get a collection that looks like this. So this is lots of these detectors in a, in a while suspended in a solution. And to an unsuspecting eye, this looks like a chemical. 
it's not a chemical. It's actually a collection of these tiny photodetectors. These are fully functional photodetectors with all the connections and everything else. And they work. So this is the measured performance of some of these detectors. You can detect light with them. This, uh, this uh, powder type material, this uh, sand type material is actually not a chemical. It's a collection of really tiny functional parts. So you can make photodetectors with whatever shape that you like and you can mass produce them. And this is one of the interesting things about the semiconductor industry. Uh, you can in integrate also onto these detectors the, uh, the filter structure that you need to do fluorescent microscopy. So in this case, we have uh, a multi-layer dielectric filter that's made of silicon dioxide and tantalum uh, pentoxide. Uh, but these uh, filters, again, are readily integrated onto the structure of the photodetector. So you can tune basically what this photodetector does. If you'd like to have a fully functional system, you need the uh, circuits to run it. Uh, we make our circuits on in silicon, so the, the cartoons here basically show you the process that's used to make uh, uh, circuit components, something that would run this uh, test setup. And again, you release them, you get this powder type collection of components. These are now circuit components that come in various shapes, and they're functional. They're made of, uh, made of silicon. Again, this powder is not a chemical. It's a collection of parts. And the last thing that you need is uh, an excitation source. How would you make a very tiny LED that can self-assemble uh, in in on a plastic substrate or onto glass? So this is an LED structure that we've designed. It's a compound semiconductor LED. It's uh, aluminum gallium arsenide. And it's meant to emit uh, uh, in red. The processes that are used to make them, again, involve uh, multiple lithographies, metal depositions, and etches. And what you get at the end of the day is a collection of LEDs that you can release from the substrate. And you can test them. So this is a test result. This is one of these LEDs. And you can apply a voltage, and they uh, turn on. And they emit br uh, bright red light. So this is uh, also the IV care of uh, one of these LEDs. So now you have all the components that you need to make a fluorescent uh, detection system. You have excitation sources, you have uh, circuitry that can run a sensing system, and you have detectors with the proper filters. The way we put them together, again, is uh, with self-assembly. It's similar to playing Lego in micron scale. So you have all these components with various shapes that just have to go to the right place to uh, complete your system. The substrates <coughs> typically look like this. So these are flexible plastic uh, uh, substrates, and the components typically look like this a powder type uh, collection of parts. Uh, we submerge these in a solution. We flow the parts past. The shapes match. They fall into the right uh, location. There is also a capillary force uh, resultant from a molten alloy that holds these parts down. So you make both electrical and mechanical connection at once. And we have a lot of examples of these types of uh, assembly processes. Uh, for example, here, what you have is an empty template for a circuit. And after self-assembly, you can see the components have dropped into the right location to give you a functional circuit. And the nice thing about it is that you can now deal with a lot of components. So let me show you, uh, show you an example here of how many components you can get. This is a template. Uh, it's a flexible plastic template that has uh, 10,000 binding sites. And uh, we can populate these with 97% yield. So you can have a lot of these systems. Now that you have a lot of these microscale components, you can do the self-assembly. And in principle, you can have thousands of individually controllable fluorescent detection systems that you can use for biological experimentation. And that's our goal. So this eventually will, uh, will interface with microfluidics uh, to, to position the cells and, and deliver, uh, deliver uh, reagents to microbials and do a complete, uh, complete assay. Uh, just to show you how these LEDs by the way, look like on, on glass, so this is a few of them on a glass substrate. When you assemble them, you can look at this one, for example, turning on. You can turn them on and off. And this is kind of a fun thing to do in the lab. I don't know. If there's something interesting about being able to turn on a light source that's really tiny, uh, microsc uh, uh, microscopic. It just kind of catches the eye. I like it. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's the, it's the weird engineer in us that just likes this stuff. Um, now back to our uh, fluorescent system. Our first generation fluorescent systems are very, uh, very rudimentary. And all there is into them is they're made on, on a glass substrate. So these are meant to be disposable systems that uh, you could use, uh, hopefully, in the developing world. Uh, they have nine uh, detection units. In each detection unit, you have nine binding sites. They are uh, meant to house an excitation source and eight uh, detectors uh, surrounding the excitation source. 
Uh, this is how the real uh, the device looks like. Uh, uh, looks like a regular glass slide, but now has all these uh, these fluorescent detection components. And after self-assembly, <coughs> this is uh, how how they look like. So you have an excitation source in the middle, eight assembled uh, detectors, and uh, you're in the process of now characterizing the fully functional uh, disposable fluorescent detection system. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, conclude my uh, my presentation. Uh, I hope that I've been able to convince you that lots of interesting things have been happening in the semiconductor industry. Many very interesting, unique, powerful techniques have been developed in this, uh, this industry in making very small devices, in making very fast devices, in making very complex devices, and very importantly, making those all very cost effective and cheap. And I think there's a tremendous potential there to migrate these technologies, these sophisticated technologies, into biology and medicine. And uh, if you have any, any suggestions of how we can do this and what's the best way of, uh, of advancing the, making this connection, I'd be very happy to hear your, your opinion. But this has been one of the main uh, driving forces behind the research in our laboratory. And, uh, and lastly, the techniques that we've developed uh, specifically uh, for self-assembly are technologies that can potentially allow either very low-cost uh, diagnostic systems to be made or very parallel systems. And we hope that uh, we can interface these very parallel systems uh, with, with biology and medicine and uh, conduct experiments with them. Uh, I, I would like to thank uh, our uh, financial sponsors. So these are various uh, agencies and organizations and foundations that have provided the uh, funding for our research. Thank you very much for your attention, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to entertain. So these are excellent questions. I'll, I'll rep repeat the questions. Uh, one is uh, about the power sources and what uh, voltage levels are required to run these uh, sensors and if uh, we use a battery, whether that's uh, sufficient for operating the system. And the second one is the computing that's necessary to make a decision for readout of these uh, sensors. Um, for the initial electronic sensors that I showed you, nanoscale electronic sensors, we need fairly accurate voltage sources. So the power, fortunately, is not an issue because they're very small and they consume very minuscule amount of power. And we can do that either with the battery or an external, uh, external power supply. But the power level, uh, levels, unfortunately, fortunately, are very, uh, very small. So uh, we can certainly power these with the battery. We do need a very good circuit that would regulate that battery and create the small voltages that you need. Um, in terms of computing, again, that's a nice thing about the, the semiconductor industry. Now you can buy a microcontroller in a few dollar range that would do all the computing that you need for these sensors. So that technology is already available. It's not usually deployed in this context. They're made for other things, but uh, fortunately that technology is available. So that the computing part of it, this could be also very cost effective. I would probably not make the computing part disposable because that's not necessary. The part that's disposable is the part that directly interfaces with the, with the sample. Uh, so that the computing part, even if it's not a few dollars, if, it, if it's $10, $20, $50, that may be OK because you don't have to throw it out. It's a very good question. Uh, that the question is whether 97% yield in self-assembly uh, is, is good enough or we need to go to 100% yield. Uh, 
It's a very good question. It's a manufacturing, uh, manufacturing related um, uh, question. If the yield is lower, the cost of production will go up. So as you go through a, a, a production uh, routine, uh, you'll make a bunch of devices that are unfortunately not usable. So at the end, you have to throw them out and you just get the ones that are useful. 97% yield is very good for these applications. We, as, a, as an aside, we work on uh, flexible displays also. And for a flexible display application, 97% yield is absolutely not uh, good enough. If you look at your computer screen, for example, even if you have one pixel missing out of about a million, you notice that. So the yield has to be a lot higher. But for these types of applications, 97% per, uh, is good because if there are 3% of devices that we cannot use, it's not fatal to our experiments. So the question is, what's the status for uh, these diagnostic tools that are meant for the developing world, the disposable, cheaper di diagnostic tools? It would very much depend on, um, on, on the group. So some groups are at the, at the very beginning of this. Some groups are developing technologies and making sure the technology is working. Our group primarily is right now focused on making sure the technology is working. And there are other groups that have taken other things much further, and they're testing them in, in the field. So there's a whole spectrum of uh, groups and small companies that are uh, active in this, uh, in this arena. Before coming to the University of Washington, I was at another institution. And uh, the work we did in that institution now has turned to uh, actually a startup company that is doing, the, uh, doing tests. So some of them have gone quite far. Some of them are, are very experimental. So that's an excellent question. The question is uh, whether we can control the orientation of receptor molecules on the surface. The short answer is, unfortunately, we can't control them very closely. What we do right now is that we primarily rely on self-assembled monolayers. So there's a covalent bond between the molecule and the surface to uh, deposit the first molecular layer, and then we build the structure on top of that. Um, unfortunately, that, that does not give us very close control over the orientation of the receptor. So we don't know exactly at what orientation they are sitting on the surface and what percentage of them are operational or non-operational. With the tunneling experiment, uh, we can certainly go to one molecule. I'm sorry, I have to re repeat the uh, question. So the question is, in mass spectroscopy, uh, the level the, of detection of uh, interest is hundreds of thousands of molecules down to maybe 100,000 molecules or lower. What is it that we can do with these electronic techniques? Uh, we can certainly go to one molecule with the tunneling devices. With the field effect devices or, uh, or nanoelectrodes that uh, we're operating based on a differential uh, mode of operation. I am not 100% sure how low we can go, um, but I would guess that uh, hundreds of molecules would be doable. So the question is, that's a, a great question. The question is, if you have a complex uh, solution, are the sensitivities good enough to differentiate between various uh, molecules that you're interested in detecting? We haven't really used any complex uh, solution with these sensors. The experiment that comes closest uh, uh, to what you had in mind is 
an experiment in which the, we try to detect various strands of DNA, and we intentionally, so these are the DNA strands that are 12 bases long, and we intentionally introduced errors in these uh, strands to see if we can differentiate between these or not. And we could do that, actually. If the strand was 12 bases long, you could tell whether there was a 100% match or whether there was a molecule with one mismatch or three or five. That we could do, but the experiment was done with uh, diff uh, separate independent exposures to these molecules. So we didn't mix them all together. Uh, and in principle, I believe you can mix them together and see what happens. And uh, we have to do those experiments and determine the sensitivity.